Evidence of the Scattering Part E Asia Okay, so you should be coming over from Part D of Part 10 of this series. These videos are a part of a docu-series and should be watched from the beginning in order if you're going to understand what is being presented. So please, if you have not watched Parts 1 through 10D, please stop this video and start back from Video 1 and watch them consecutively for true context. Okay, so this is part E of part 10, which is dealing with the evidence of the scattering. In the first part, we dealt with the history in the United States. In part B, we dealt with South America. Part C was the Caribbean. And the last part we dealt with was in Africa. As we continue to discuss this, what we will do right now is move on to the next part of the world, very rarely discussed, and that is dealing with Asia. So to get the conversation started, Let's go to the Middle East in areas of places like Yemen or even in Turkey. No community in Yemen has suffered more from the current war than al muhamashin the marginalized ones, a name adopted by the believed Africa-descended ethnic group themselves to escape the derogatory label given by broader Yemeni society, Akdam, that literally translates to servants. I always go to look for food and ask people. Sometimes my husband gets paid for work he does, and sometimes he doesn't. He sometimes brings one kilo of flour and sometimes he brings nothing. I cooked yesterday afternoon and kept the little leftovers we had for today. Sometimes we fall asleep hungry. The dismal conditions of this cave sanctuary are sadly not a far cry from the centuries of discrimination, exploitation and poverty experienced by the Mohammashin. Judged as the lowest part of the Yemeni social hierarchy and lacking access to basic services. So this is Yemen. And you might not be aware of the Yahudim presence in the land, but this is where they scattered to after the fall of Jerusalem. This is how Islam was even created because of the influence of the Yahudim in that area. I've made a video on that if you've never seen that. These people of Yemen are the lowest class of people in that country because of who they are. But again, they don't know who they are either. And over time, they are intermingled. So they just think that they are hated because they are darker skinned. But it's much more deeper than that. These people are a part of the curses. Let's move on to Turkey. <laughs> Aisha Urundu remembers the Dana Bayram festival as a family tradition. The celebration is for Turks of African descent. And her family's been going almost since they arrived in the Ottoman Empire in the 18th century. They were brought as slaves, but Aisha says the event today makes her community feel free and welcome. I've always tried to attend the Dana festival. I try to go every year because it's very important for our culture and heritage. The tradition and culture of ancestors must be passed on to the next generations. Even at 87 years old, it's still Aisha's favorite thing to do. The festival dates back to the 16th century and includes the slaughtering of cows and a celebration of African culture. But in the last decade, the emphasis has been on teaching oral history. The aim of documenting our oral history is to keep our dying culture alive. We want to have more written information about our culture and traditions so that the next generation of Afro-Turks who want to learn about their ancestors can have resources and an archive in their hands. The festival ends with a feast. At least 20,000 Turks of African descent live in Turkey. According to the chairman of Afro-Turk Solidarity Association, Many of them are in Izmir and other cities on the Asian coast. The Dana Baram Festival brings them together every year to protect and preserve their African culture. But the challenge remains how to engage the younger generation, because most of them have moved to bigger cities. As young Afro-Turks, we want to keep this going somehow. We're very happy to celebrate this Dana Bayram and want to pass on the tradition to more generations by developing and preserving it and celebrating with our children in the future. The community is determined to keep the festival alive as a platform where African history in Turkey is retold. 
these people became assimilated and intermingled, but in many of them, you can still see us. They are marginalized and not even considered to be a part of these nations in the same way. They face oppression from their nation and they were born amongst them, but they are labeled Afro for a reason. And that's because they are not them and the countries, they want them to know it. These people are descendants of Israel. They are cursed, but it's hidden around skin color and not about true descent. These people desperately want to know who they are. And so what do they do? They later, they attach to anything that's called African because they think it represents them. And there is so much danger in doing that and not knowing who you are. Because what people normally do is they attach to the pagan witchcraft parts of traditions in Africa and they attach themselves to demons and sorcery that they should never ever entertain. And then it's so hard to get those demons off your back. I know people personally that this is their plight. Either way, what I want you to understand is that they are scattered all within the Middle East. It's just not mainstream. It's the people they call Afro whatever or black whatever. That's who they are. This is the label given to the children of Israel. It identifies that they are not a part of the nation that they're in. For instance, there are Afro Iraqis and Afro Iranians. City of Zubair near Basra in the far south of Iraq. Here you find Iraq centuries old black minority reputed to be guardians of musical traditions but relegated to the margins of society. Today members of Iraq's black community are at the bottom of the country's economic ladder. Nowadays, we are facing a lot of problems due to the economic situation. For example, there is a high unemployment rate within the black community. We demand from the Iraqi government to include representatives of the black community and set a quota for them. Since the establishment of the Iraqi state, we have not seen someone from the community occupy senior positions in the state. We have not seen a governor, a minister, nor a lawmaker. This black Iraqi percussionist, Adnan Abdurrahman, shows off his drumming skills. He is a member of one of the popular music troops that have made Zubair famous throughout the country. The minority numbers, 250,000 to 2 million people, according to a wide range of informal estimates. <laughs> Today, black Iraqis continue to face systematic discrimination and marginalization, according to the Minority Rights Group International. The GILS organization estimates there are approximately 2 million black Iraqis, a claim impossible to verify since the government does not keep statistics on this. Most blacks here are descendants of Africans brought as slaves to Iraq South more than a thousand years ago to drain marshes and build the city of Basra. And many Iraqis still call blacks Abid, an Arabic word that means slave. Many white Iraqis claim that term isn't meant to offend. They don't think black Iraqis are oppressed. No, they have the same rights we have. Black people and white people are the same. Same religion, same jobs. In Basra, however, many black Iraqis have menial jobs. There are no black members of the Iraqi parliament. I mean, if that right there doesn't show you how race is a social construct and it's only used for mental manipulation, I don't know what else can prove it to you. This man right here says he's white. These people are black and he's white. This is how they feel in Iraq. Let's stay in Asia and move over to this group of people. I was blessed by our sister Sarah, who told me about these scattered Hebrews that are in India, known as the Cities. This is from a documentary from RJ Inspire. The Cities have lived in India for several centuries. Most of them were brought to India as slaves by the Portuguese and the British in the 16th century. And some cities came to India as merchants, traders, some as soldiers, 
According to history, the first cities were brought to India in the 7th century by the Arab merchants and Arab traders to work as soldiers, servants, blacksmiths, carpenters, masons, and some were brought in as slaves. Hello, brother. Hi. More city brothers and sisters here. What's your name, brother? Pascal. Pascal, okay. I just met a Pascal. Pascal, where was he? Oh, yeah. I'm staying in Gadagira. Yes. Ah, oh, you know Pascal in Gadagira. Yes. His wife, um, Mula Green. Meet the Sidis, India's lost African tribe. The Sidi people, India's forgotten African tribe. Only a handful of Indians are aware that Africans and Indians are not novices to each other. At least 25,000 African origin ethnic tribes have been living in near complete obscurity in India for millennia. The Sidis are an African origin Indian group mostly found in the Indian states of Karnataka and Gujarat. They self identify as Indians who communicate native dialects, wear native attire, and follow the same local rituals and traditions. Yet, due to their physical appearance, they are usually considered as foreign people and live in the tiny group in rural regions and wilds. The Sidi people are an Indo-Africa tribal community that descended from the Bantu people of Africa. Their presence in India can be traced back as early as the 7th century. The most likely reason for their initial appearance in India was slavery brought over by the Arabs and later Europeans during their colonizing of Africa. When slavery was abolished in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Sidi people are believed to have fled into the dense jungle areas and isolated parts of India, where they are still found to be living to this day in small settlements. Some have also said that they came as soldiers with the Arab community and independently as sailors and merchants. On first glance, cities stand out because of their physical appearance. Despite having lived in India for centuries, the city people have managed to retain their typically African features because they marry within their communities. It's quite rare for cities to marry a person from outside of their community. They dress in the same way as other locals and speak local languages fluently. Imran is a city a descendant of the Bantu people from Southeast Africa. He believes his ancestors originally came from Uganda. Now he lives in a small village called Jambor with his mother and grandmother. To preserve their African identity, some isolated themselves, creating small villages in various parts of Gujarat. But today, Life for thousands of cities, such as Imran, is far from glamorous. Most live on the fringes of society, in abject poverty. They listen, and today Imran and his friends support themselves by performing African dances spiked with a bit of drama for visitors. See, these people are Israel and were brought to India and Pakistan in captivity. They are mostly forgotten, but they still feel our plight and they are marginalized. You see, this is all very real. Look at this. I'm yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, no passport, no visa. No, India said, no, you can't go. No you go. stay here. Huh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to Africa, but they won't with, give my passport. With, with Bindo? Yeah, with Bindo? Oh. Samuel? Hello, Samuel. Uh, Justin? Justin? Yeah. English you speak? Justin. You're going English. What, what's your mom's name? Nila. Nila. Nila, Nila Mariani. Yes. Nila said, I want to go to Africa, but no, they don't give no, me passport. <laughs> no passport, no visa. No visa. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Really, really having a wonderful, lovely time here in the city community. Now I'm in the village of Samrani. I met this lady. She says, Well, 
all I want to do, I want to go back to Africa because look at my hair, I'm African, I want to go to Africa. And I said, but you Indian, how can you go to Africa? I said, I don't know, help me go back to Africa. <laughs> so if any African government is listening, please, can you help Indian Africans who want to visit Africa to come to your country? No school. Yeah, no school. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, so, so when the British brought African people, yeah, and uh, they didn't give them education in India. Yes, yeah. Wow. This woman is Indian, but she wants to go back to Africa because she knows this is where her heritage is. She knows this because she looks just like us. She knows she doesn't share heritage with the people of India, and she wants to go back to Africa. But go back where? Africa is a continent. You see, she doesn't know who she is. This is what he prophesied would be. If you don't understand that he said this would happen, you are not looking at the world properly. He prophesied, I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 7. He also said, and Yahuwah will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahuwah will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. What you should understand is that I'm giving you evidence of the validity of the scriptures. This is very real stuff. All these people are labeled Afro whatever, and they are marginalized and not given proper place in society. They believe it's because of the color of their skin, just like we do. But that is a satanic lie so that the people of the world do not truly worship Yahuwah in spirit and in truth. But the time for these lies, they're over. It's done. So we will stop here in discussing Asia. And so you can continue to understand our plight. What we will do next is move on to the last region of the world, which is Europe. Click the link to the next video and let's talk some more. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay, thanks again for watching. Again, thank you for your patience with getting this information out. Please, if this has blessed you, please don't forget to share this with your family and your friends. This is part E of part 10 of this series. Click this link or just move on to the next video in the playlist. As always, I want to thank all who donate and contribute to this ministry. Please know this series, it would not be possible without your support. I thank you all sincerely. Be blessed. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for watching. See you in the sixth part, the last part, to part 10. I love you all.